And if you would have told me that a Columbine could happen at Columbine, I would have said, no way. The first thing that crossed my mind is this has to be a senior prank. This can't be happening at Columbine High School. In my 20 years prior, I can count on two hands the number of fistfights that occurred at our school. This couldn't be happening until I ran out of my office and Kiki went down the English hallway to the English department. I went down the hallway and all of a sudden my worst nightmare becomes a reality because from here to about 50 yards back I see a gunman coming towards me. And that's something I was never prepared for. Shots are getting closer. I said, we're in trouble. Some girls are praying, girls are screaming. Reach in my pocket, pull out the first key, put it in the door and it opens it on the first try. And I got to tell you, I don't know if it's divine intervention, what it was, but we were saved. This key was not marked specially. It wasn't larger than the others. It wasn't in a special place. I reached in and I tried it for 15 years after. I wasn't able to do it. We had a school resource officer, Neil Gardner, who was exchanging gunfire. We had over 500 responding officers applied within two minutes that it came to our school. But they were being told they could not go into the building until SWAT arrived. And in my heart of hearts, I truly believe if the protocol that we have today that engaged the perpetrator immediately, we would not have lost 13. These kids had a weapon, walked out with a duffel bag, and the mom says, what are you doing with that rifle? Oh, it's just a prop for the school play. Never checked. The dad finds a pipe bomb in the kid's room, and the dad says, or not in the room, in the garage, and the dad says, what is that? Oh, we're doing an uh, experiment for school. Six months before, they call up the Harris household saying, all your ammunition's in for the 20th, and dad says, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. And they have the right to freedom of expression, and I can't violate their civil liberties. As a parent, you need to be a parent, and you need to go in their rooms, and you need to check out because they're crying out for help. Now, it had an impact on a lot of kids in that classroom because they even had a kid holding up the sign stating one bleeding to get the police to come in and the paramedics come in and the commander said that's a trick by the two killers to get us into the building. Well, it was May 6th and his dad comes home and his dad was a probation officer and he comes home at lunch and all of a sudden he raises the garage door and Greg's hanging from the rafter. He said, I can no longer live with these images. But I hear Mr. Sanders' breath breathing shallowly and I see that blood in all the shirts and we could not keep him alive. And that's when I realized that there were so many people impacted by the events of that day. And that's when we continued to look for signs to offer the help that so many were crying out for, not only kids, but adults. If you don't help yourself, you're not going to be able to help anyone else. And that was the best piece of advice. So yes, I was an employee in Tower One of World Trade Center. If I'm watching the television and I don't know that audio and visual of the towers on 9-11 are going to come on, I instantly get triggered. It starts in my stomach, it goes right up, it gets stuck at my throat, my hands start shaking, and it takes me several minutes to, to, to self-regulate. People who were at the first going postal uh, experience, still experience psychological, physiological responses. So the answer to how long does this last, it could be indefinitely. Trauma doesn't play fair. Trauma is cognitive. It's a brain thing. It affects your brain. Grief is the emotional response that we have to losing someone, but trauma actually has a neurobiological and physiological component. The whole notion about Active shooter workplace coverage just came about after recent incidences where funerals were being paid for, counseling, long-term counseling, as Frank talked about. You gotta have money for this because trauma is not gonna close up shop after two weeks and say, okay, you know, we're, we're done here. And I'm a big believer in preparation resilience building. I go into companies that have not had an event yet and teach the company and teach stakeholders how to be resilient so that there is a better foundation from which, from which people to snap back to their baseline. One of the reasons why Frank was so successful in retaining not only his teachers but his students 
is because who he was and how he ran his institution before that. He was highly engaged. He had relationships. Every company wants to make money and generate revenue. I get it. But a company has got to have a higher purpose. Something larger than that. Because that higher purpose is what you can help your stakeholders anchor to that is larger than themselves and larger than the crisis event itself. 